Hey everyone, uh, this is Jason Tondro, your English professor, and uh, I wanted to record another brief lecture on one of the poems that we've been using in class. Um, this poem is on is The Flea, John Donne's poem, The Flea, uh, from the Renaissance. Uh, it's on page 901 in our book, which for those of you uh, watching from home, is Literature, the Human Experience, uh, 11th edition. So we're going to talk about the flea, and the flea gets brought up a lot in class. Uh, a lot of students are confused by it. It's it's challenging poem, especially because it's, it's 400 years old, and and so it takes a long time to kind of walk through. So rather than use class time for that, I thought I would make a little video and kind of give you some background information on, on Dunn and the poem, and then we'll kind of walk us through it, and you can kind of see how it's working and, and how the poem is constructed and, and how it says what it's trying to say. Let's start off with a little bit of background information on Dunn. For those of you that know anything about me, you know that it's very important that we set the poem in its historical context. Who was John Donne? John Donne was a contemporary of Shakespeare. They, they knew each other. They knew the same people. Um, Dunn's a little bit later than Shakespeare, which just means that he was younger than Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare was a playwright and an actor, which, for those of you that have been in class, you, you, we've already talked about this, being an actor, uh, being a playwright, being involved with the theater in Shakespeare's England was a very low occupation. It was like beggar, <laughs> vagabond, uh, you know, bandit, and then up actor, right? It was, it was considered very low class. And this was used as a rationalization, a defense for why women weren't allowed on stage was because, well, that's, you know, that's, that's immoral activity. That's a, a, a bad job. We want to keep women away from something like that. Well, and we can debate the validity of that argument another day, but, uh, but if theater was considered to be low, sort of the common man's uh, entertainment, poetry was the opposite. Poetry was, was the peak. Poetry was where you wanted to be at. That was art. That was real art. And if you were a writer and you wrote poetry, well, now you, now you were talking about upper class art. And in fact, many of the uh, aristocrats, the lords and ladies and, and, and nobility of, of England were also accomplished poets. To be a poet was considered to be part of the education of the aristocratic class uh, in, in Renaissance England. Queen Elizabeth wrote poetry and people wrote poetry for her and it was it was a a noble pursuit in the literal sense. It was that, that is to say it was a pursuit done by nobles. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, Dunn was, was not nobility. He was not an aristocrat. He was well-educated, but he had, uh, he, he had a reputation as something of a ladies' man. There was basically two John Dunn's. John Dunn's career is very clearly divided into two parts. And for the first part of Dunn, what we might call early Dunn, uh, he was a courtier. He was a guy that hung out at court or that was trying to get into court, that wanted to hang out with wealthy and powerful people, and he didn't have, he made his money by being a poet, by being a writer, and he would find a wealthy patron, somebody who had a lot of money, a member of the aristocracy, the noble class, and he would write them poems, or he would, he would write books and dedicated to that person, and in exchange, that person would bestow lavish gifts upon him, or sometimes not so lavish, <laughs> right? Um, Poets had just as a hard of a time getting people to pay, uh, to pay their bills back then as, as someone might today. In other words, a noble might say that you're, he's, he's hiring you, he's going to pay you, but after you've written, written the book and it's come out, that money may never actually show up. And a lot of, we have a lot of records of poets who struggled with uh, getting their patrons to actually pay what they were owed. Um, Johnson, Ben Johnson, another contemporary of Don and Shakespeare. Is, is wrote some, some wonderful poems on, on this uh, topic. But anyway, let's get back to Dunn. So Dunn was sort of a ladies' man, and uh, he, he was young and eligible, and uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't rich or anything. He was far from it, in fact, but he was brilliant and uh, good with words and, and a poet. And he, uh, the, the story goes behind this poem, The Flea, is that it was a, it's a seduction poem. It's a poem written to a young woman who refuses to go to bed with Dunn on the grounds that her virginity is sacred, is important to her, and 
that she doesn't want to lose it to somebody like Dunn. And the story goes that this poem was originally told in church when Dunn was in the church pews standing next to this woman. Uh, the, later on, this lifestyle would get done into trouble. He, he fell in love with the, the daughter of a wealthy noble in the, the court of Queen Elizabeth, and they secretly married. When this marriage was discovered, Dunn was basically exiled from court and pretty soon he and his wife had a few kids and he was really struggling to make ends meet to pay his bills um, when he he was a man that was dependent on court patrons and and once he had alienated that court because he had secretly gotten married to someone's daughter uh, it became impossible for him to find work, and, and he, he, no, no patron would hire him. This is when King James, uh, James I of England, King James VI of Scotland, decided what Dunn's fate would be. King James decided that Dunn would become uh, a priest. He would become uh, a preacher at uh, the cathedral in, in London. And... Uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in London, and and he informed Dunn of this choice, like, well, here's the deal, you, I'll give you a job, and your job is, is to be, a, you're going to become a priest. Well, this required Dunn to change his complete lifestyle, and, and he initially refused, but as I say, he had a few kids, and the bills kept mounting, and, and he eventually agreed, and he became a, a preacher in, in the church. And now think for a minute. Imagine, I don't know how many out there, when was the last time any of you heard a sermon? You know, I, I teach my, these classes in southern Georgia, and, you know, most of you folks, this sermon isn't that long ago. But for some of you that might be watching, a sermon might be a little bit more remote. But think for a minute. What if every time you heard a sermon, it was being written and delivered by one of the greatest writers in the world today. Imagine, imagine if someone with the rhetorical powers of Shakespeare were writing the sermons and delivering them every Sunday. Think about how powerful that would be. King James was not stupid. He, he, he recognized Dunn's genius. And so look, we gotta put you to work. And so he, he this, and this is exactly what happened. And this became the, the second phase of Dunn's career, what we might call late Dunn. And, and Dunn's dedication and his devotion to, to God and to his new faith was quite profound. But he was troubled by faith. That doesn't mean that it came easy to him. It certainly did not. He knew that he had done bad things when he was young, and he knew that he was still tempted to do bad things even now. We'll read some later Dunn uh, in, in other other chapters of this book, but this poem, The Flea, comes from early Dunn. Bad, bad boy Dunn, <laughs> okay? Dunn, Dunn the player, all right? Okay. So it's a seduction poem. Let's take a look at it. Let's just read through it, and, uh, and then we'll go back. Mark but this flea, and mark in this how little that which thou deniest me is. It sucked me first, and now sucks thee. And in this flea our two bloods mingled be. Thou knowest that this cannot be said a sin, nor shame, nor loss of maidenhead. Yet this enjoys before it woo, and pampered swells with one blood made of two. And this, alas, is more than we would do. Oh, stay, three lives in one flea spare, where we almost, yea, more than married are. This flea is you and I, and this our marriage bed and marriage temple is. Though parents grudge, and you, we are met and cloistered in these living walls of jet. Though use make you apt to kill me, let not to that self-murder added be, and sacrilege, three sins in killing three. 
cruel and sudden. Hast thou since purpled thy nail in blood of innocence? Wherein could this flea guilty be, except in that drop which it sucked from thee? Yet thou triumphst, and sayest that thou findst not thyself nor me the weaker now. Tis true. Then learn how false fears be. Just so much honor, when thou yieldst to me, were waste as this flea's death took life from thee. All right, now, <laughs> what was that all about? Well, you could, you could tell that there's a flea. Okay, now look at the poem for a minute. Look at the poem on the page. I don't know, maybe you're looking this poem up on the internet or something, but what's very important as we look at this poem is the spaces in between those stanzas. I know it doesn't sound like much. It sounds like a silly little thing. But these spaces in between the stanzas is where action takes place. And we can only tell what action is happening when we read the lines and Dunn walks us through those actions. Okay, so where do we start? We start with the woman that's standing next to him in church. Remember, this is 1630s, right? Um, well, this is young Dunn, so probably it's more like around 1600 um, before James has arrived. Uh, and, and, you know, it's 400 years ago, and this is going to sound really gross, and you're all going to get grossed out by this, but the fact that people might have fleas was a little bit more common <laughs> then than it is now, right? Uh, we, we uh, our, our standards of personal hygiene are a great level higher because we can make them higher. It was hard to not have fleas uh, in, in 1600. But in any case, so she finds a flea on her arm and or her shoulder or something, and she, she takes the flea. And, and Dunn is talking about this flea that she has captured, or that he has captured, but it seems to be her, because talks about, he says about how it bit him first and now it's bitten her. Mark but this flea. Hey, pay attention. That's all that Mark means. Pay attention. Pay attention to this flea. And pay attention how little that which thou deniest me is. He's talking about her virginity. This is a poem about, about your virginity. And it plays in that metaphor of blood a lot through the whole poem. It, the flea, sucked me first, so now my blood's in it. My blood is in the flea. And now sucks thee, and now your blood is in the flea. And in this flea our two bloods mingled be. And this becomes a metaphor for marriage, right? Or for uh, 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 pregnancy. Thou knowest that this cannot be said a sin. It's not a sin that the flea bit me and bit you, that it has made one being out of two that our bodies are mingled in the body of this flea. That's not a sin. It's not a shame, and you haven't lost your virginity. You have lost blood to this flea. But that's not a sin. Right? Okay. Yet this, the flea, enjoys before it woo. The flea didn't have to court you. He didn't have to get permission from your father to marry you. He didn't have to buy you chocolate or flowers. He didn't have to do any of that stuff. He had, the flea is the ultimate premarital sex, <laughs> right? He, he wanted you and he sucked from you. And pampered swells with one blood made of two. This is that pregnancy metaphor. The flea has grown fat with one blood, a child, made of two. Now, the flea's not literally pregnant. We're using it as a metaphor, just like in Hills like white elephants, where you know when the woman looks and sees she's the, the hill, and she says, you know, it looks like a white elephant, it looks like an elephant from here. And this is a metaphor for the fact that she's pregnant, right? Whenever you or you see it again in, um, because I could not stop for death, this idea of the hill, the swollen hill, as a metaphor, for a woman's, a pregnant woman's, belly. Right? This is an old metaphor, very very old. All right, and this, alas, the fact that it's, that the flea has enjoyed her blood, her sex, is more than we would do. It's, it's had more fun than we. This flea is on top of the world. <laughs> okay, all right. 
Now, now we have the first of those spaces. The stands is over. We have that space in between lines. Look at the beginning of the next line. Oh, stay. Three lives in one flea spare. She's getting ready to kill it. She's going to crush the flea. She's going to kill the flea. And he's saying, that's all I mean by stay. He means, don't do it. Stop. Hold on. Hold on a minute. Let the flea live. Three lives in one flea spare. Whose lives are we talking about? We're talking about his, hers, and the fleas. Or the, the mingled one life that it's created inside of it. Out of there too. Where we almost yea more than married are. Is he's comparing, and this whole stanza is about comparing the flea to a kind of wedding structure. Like inside the flea, our blood has been mingled. We use this metaphor for marriage even to this day, the, the idea that we become one flesh, right? Or we use it when we talk about sex. We talk about how, you know, you really love somebody and you feel like, like you know, you're one person, like you're, you know, you're like you're united with that person in love, like you're, you're, one, you're one being. This flea is you and I, and this, the flea itself, our marriage bed, and marriage temple is. When he talks about um, these living walls of jet, jet is just the color, jet black, right? Black, and of course what's black is the flea. So the flea is like a church. I know, this sounds like it's an you know, exaggeration, but, but Dunn's a master of this kind of poetry. and He's all about taking a metaphor and just making it work so hard and, and impressing somebody with his dazzling command of, of poetic language and metaphor. So now the flea is like, is like a church. And inside that church, our two selves have become mingled into one. It's like we're married already, inside, inside the flea. <laughs> right? Though parents grudge, our parents, your parents, don't want you to sleep with me. And you, he knows. And you don't want to sleep with me either. <laughs> right? We are met and cloistered. I mean, like cloistered like, um, like a religious folk. Like we're, we're locked in to these living walls of jet, these black living walls of the flea's body. Though use, that's um, just custom, uh, like habit. Uh, the, the normal way of doing things means that when you find a flea, you should kill it. That's what you do with fleas, you kill them. Though use makes you apt to kill me, let not to that self-murder added be. Because of course, he, his, his metaphor is, is that his life, his blood is inside the flea. So when you kill the flea, you'll be killing him. But you'll also be killing you. Don't kill yourself. That's a sin. And you're also killing whatever you're also and sacrilege, because we're also deciding that the flea is like a church. So when you destroy the flea, it's like you're burning down a church. That's what he means by sacrilege. Right? Don't burn down the church. <laughs> All right. The second of those big spaces in between. Long, uh, paragraphs 2 and 3, stanzas 2 and 3. Cruel and sudden, hast thou since purpled thy nail in blood of innocence? What just happened? She has purpled her nail. We often refer to blood as purple, uh, even though it's not purple, it's just red. But what he's asking here is, is, you've got blood on your fingernail now because you crushed the flea. She's killed it. She's crushed it. In between. Parent stanzas 2 and 3. Notice he refers to the flea as the blood of innocence. Because the, the flea didn't do anything wrong. The flea was just being a flea. He's just doing what fleas did. Wherein could this flea guilty be? If the flea did anything wrong, if it was bad, if it was a bad flea, what did it, where could it have gotten this sin from? This is sort of playing off the idea of original sin, right? Uh, the idea that you know, sins are inherited. What, what did it do? What, where, wherein could this flea guilty be, except in that drop which it sucked from thee? It must have, it must have gotten its sin from you. Yet thou triumphed, you've crushed it, as if it was a battle. Right? You triumph as, a, as if it was a big fight, instead of just crushing a little insect. 
and sayest that thou finds not thyself, nor me the weaker now. This is no, what he's saying is, is that he's telling us in, in the poem that the woman that he's talking to has said, well, look, I've crushed the flea. And you kept telling me not to crush the flea because it would be like killing you and killing me and doing all these terrible things. And now I've crushed the flea and guess what? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm not hurt. And neither are you. I killed the flea and it didn't do anything. It, it wasn't even painful. Tis true. You're right. It wasn't. Then learn how false fears be. You're right. You were so afraid that killing a flea would be painful and now you killed a flea and it turns out that you didn't even notice. Just so much honor. It's going to be just as painful. Just as terribly lethal. When you yield to me as this flea's death, took life from thee. In other words, he's been building up this whole poem talking about how terrible it is to hurt the flea. And then she does it, and she says, look, and it doesn't even hurt. And he says, yeah, exactly. It didn't even hurt. And it's not going to hurt, and you're not even going to notice when you lose your virginity. <laughs> right? It's like he knew all along when he set up this huge metaphor of don't kill the flea. He knew that she would prove him wrong, and he needed her to prove him wrong in order for his point to actually be made, right? He knew that she would kill it anyway, because that's the only way that his argument, that losing your virginity is like crushing a flea, it's just as insignificant. That was his real point, and the only way that he could get to that point is if she destroys the flea. Okay. Well, successful or unsuccessful, uh, people tend to have a lot of personal opinions about questions like premarital sex and virginity. But, um, but you can kind of see how this poem is working and his allegory, right? His allegorical, as an allegorical poet or a metaphor, he takes this symbol and just plays the hell out of it, right? And this is kind of what made Dunn distinctive and something that we still talk about and study uh, when we read his poetry today. All right, well, that's the fleet, all right? Thanks.